because of the digital revolution, which is all around us, there is music everywhere, in hotel lobbies, in restaurants, in elevators. You cannot buy a pair of jeans without being exposed to it. It is so ubiquitous, so accessible, that we sometimes forget that it tries to convey a meaning, a message. In Beethoven's time, it was rare for a person to hear all nine symphonies in a lifetime. Today, we push a button. We choose the conductor, we choose the orchestra. We stop, we start, we skip, we compare performances, and quite often, in this process, we miss the point. Already in ancient Greece, different modes, like major and minor, were endowed with different powers, some corrupting, sensual, some character building. Soldiers in ancient Greece were forbidden to listen to certain modes so it won't soften their resolve in battle. According to Plato, the entire universe was made of concentric spheres that related to one another harmonically in music, hence the music of the spheres. And for centuries, there was an interval in music. It's called the tritone, three whole steps from C to F sharp, for example, that was considered to be an evil interval. It was forbidden. It was called the devil in music, diabolus in musica. And until 1900, it was not used melodically by composers. Now, this ability of music, the, the, the understanding, the notion that music has this power, this influence, is alive and well today. The Taliban, the uh, Cultural Revolution in China, both of them considered our music morally corrupting. In Soviet Russia, composers were persecuted for writing subversive music, whatever that was. And of course, Nazi Germany declared many composers degenerate. Even in this country, in our USA, 100 years ago, jazz was deemed lewd and vulgar, not fit for decent company. So how does music do it? How does it convey messages? The easiest way is by association evoking a time and a place. You hear a tango, and right away, you're in a nightclub. Or better yet, in Buenos Aires, its place of origin. Uh, a march will conjure up a military parade. Uh, a group of people marching S1 with, to one pulse. The sound of the organ, a place of worship. The call of a horn, open fields, the woods, nature. Right? Open intervals. Aaron Copeland uses it so beautifully in his music. This ability of music to conjure up memories is so powerful, so potent, that it acts as a liaison between the living and the dead. Orpheus uses the magic of his lyre, the enchantment of chant, to retrieve his beloved Eurydice from Hades, from the land of the dead, his newly wed, newly dead wife. The role of harmony in coloring our emotions, our feelings, is quite obvious. Take any Hitchcock film and play it without the soundtrack, without Bernard Herrmann's spooky, eerie harmonies, and you will realize right away how crucial they are in creating this amazing atmosphere of suspense and scary feeling. Musical forms are also mirrors 
of who we are as humans. Many of them are cyclical, like the sonata form with its recapitulation where themes return at the end of the movement, or the theme and variations. The composer chooses a theme, his own or borrowed, and takes it on a journey through some adventures. And as it drifts away from the starting point, it starts turning around in a curve, elliptically. And the farther away it gets, the closer it gets from the other side. And the theme returns home. The theme comes back at the end. And it is wiser. It has more wisdom, more self-knowledge, because it's been through a lot. And we hear it differently. Even though the notes are the same, we hear something pr more profound as the theme returns. Now, when we say that theme in music comes back, we abandon scientific time, chronological time on the clock that flows forever forward in a measured way. And we begin to experience time the way we really experience it in life. So a minute can last an hour, and an hour can last a minute. Time slows down, time speeds up, time stops. And quite often, it turns around elliptically in a circle and returns to a starting point, a deja vu in sound. We all have experienced it, I'm sure. One and two and three and four and five. Five and four and three and two and one. Forward again. Ta -da -pa -pa -da -da. Mozart, right? Another example, um, Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, the beautiful second theme, is a perfect circle. It rolls back on itself, comes back to the beginning. Directions in music also convey meaning. A phrase going up expresses optimism, energy, hope, elation. A phrase pointing down conveys sadness, depression, wilting, collapse, death. We've been conditioned since time immemorial to think of heaven as being up there. Hell down here. Good is up. Bad is down. Sunrise. Sunset. All right. Here is an aria from a famous opera. You all know it. The heroine comes on the stage and introduces herself in a habanera. <laughs> Oh, a chromatic line creeping down, and right away you know this woman is up to no good. <laughs> She's a troublemaker. She's a femme fatale. Carmen, of course, I'm sure you all know it. Huh? Tchaikovsky was a master of melancholy, and many of his beautiful tunes point downward, like the, um, let's say, the aria from Eugene Onegin, Lensky's aria. Lensky is about to engage in a duel, and he knows he will not come out of it alive. It's pre-dawn in the forest, and he sits on a log, and he sings, Down. We all know what's going to happen. The music tells us. On the other hand, when Tchaikovsky is not so depressed, he can give us a, a tune like the one in, in one of his symphonies that goes up and up and up and away. This is what happens with the direction. Now, yielding to gravity, a falling line is really a stylized sigh. Oh. Do you know anybody who sighs upward? <laughs> I don't. But in a baseball game, when something exciting happened in the field, thousands of people together go, 
an upward roar up. Now, a sense of well-being will be communicated by a phrase that balances very nicely the up and the down. Equilibrium. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. A perfect pyramidal structure in sound. A child hearing this little tune will be comforted. Will feel, yeah, everything is fine. If you take it to a more sophisticated level, mm, Beethoven's Violin Concerto. The same principle at work. Or let's take one more example. Um, the Moldau by Smetana. Yeah, the, the Rhine River is flowing majestically towards Prague. What a wonderful sense of grand, comfortable equilibrium this music conveys. Now, this is a story about a composer who could not express himself in words, because had he done so, he would have lost his life. Shostakovich, under the terrible dictatorship of Stalin, living in the very jaws of terror. So in 1942, he writes a trio. And this trio tells the story better than any words could. It's for piano, violin, and cello. The piece begins with a cello, all alone, playing as high as possible on the instrument, impossibly high, eerily high, a few bars all alone. Three, four bars later, the violin joins as low as possible for the fiddle at the bottom of, so immediately you get the very disturbing feeling that something is awfully wrong, that the world order has gone upside down topsy-turvy. Later on in the movement, he requests the musician to play fortississimo, triple forte, which is as loud as possible with a mute on. And the result is a muffled scream, shouting with your mouth being gagged or listening to a prisoner being tortured behind the thick walls of a prison. The second movement is even worse. It's a scherzo, and he requests a tempo that is, on purpose, way too fast for the material. So it sounds hysterical, it sounds frenzied, it sounds mad, it sounds out of control, brutally so, and there are some convulsive gestures of <laughs> It's a frightening piece of music, you should really hear it. And in the midst of all this craziness, a gentle waltz is being torn to pieces, to shreds, and tossed about. Shards of a broken world. Now, Schoenberg's invention of his non-central, non-gravitational system of 12 tones is also a reflection of a political reality. Until about 120 years ago, Society was organized concentrically. King, bishop, church, urban upper classes, peasantry, each one knowing his place. The king was tonic, the home key. The bishop was the dominant of this musical social scale and so on. Now with the collapse of monarchies and the birth of democratic, socialist theories, we have in front of us a different chess game. No king, no bishop, all equal pawns with identical privileges, at least in theory. For Schoenberg, the old musical order, his feeling about the old musical order was similar. For him, tonal music was exhausted, 
decadent, anachronistic, and had no future. So he dreams up this musical communism. All notes are equal. The fact that this fanatically idealistic utopian system did not take root may very well be a statement on human nature. The reason communism failed and why democracy is such a fragile construct. The most mystical and fantastic element in music is silence. Silence in music is the space between God's finger and Adam's in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. Active, vibrant, not an absence, but a presence. The empty spaces in Henry Moore's work are as eloquent as the metal or stone that enclosed them. In Schubert's first song, silence becomes a climax of the song. It is, his, he wrote it when he was 17. It is the song of Gretchen at the spinning wheel. We all know the story. She has been seduced by Faust. She is pregnant with his child. She's sitting in front of the spinning wheel. Her life is in ruins. She is lost. The whirl of the spinning wheel reflecting her agitation, her restlessness. And she's, she's thinking of Faust, his noble gait, his smile, the power of his eyes. And there's a constant crescendo. The pressure of his hand, his kiss. The spinning wheel stops. So does her heart. And she slowly restarts it. This silence is the loudest moment in the song. Now, John Cage takes this component of music, silence, removes all else, and writes a piece called Four Point thirty three. Four minutes and thirty three seconds of silence. It's written for piano, mind you. I arranged it for cello. I played a little faster by that time. Now, by doing so, John Cage has crossed over from the realm of music into philosophy. How meaningful is silence going to be without? the fantastic Schubert song that envelops it, without a Beethoven symphony that traps it. When I was a child, a bagel vendor would come to the neighborhood. He would announce his arrival with a lovely sing song, and all the kids would come running down with a few pennies to buy a bagel. He had them strung on a stick, and they were delicious. One day he said to me, when you finish the bagel, Bring me back the hole. I'll give you a penny for every hole you bring me so I can bake new bagels around them. This was my first philosophy lesson. Can the hole of the bagel exist independently of the bagel? Is John Cage's work the hole of a non-existing bagel? And I'll leave you with this profound question philosophical challenge. Thank you. <laughs>